Welcome back to the Judo Wall. I'm Dennis Jones, and today I want to talk to you about one of the most confusing terms I've heard in many years. And that term is at the heart of what we do at Judo, but I want to dispel some myths and explain the differences and get some terminology right across the board. So that word is mobile payments. And I hear that word being used in so many different ways. And part of that is because mobile is becoming such a force for change in the industry that a lot of people want to have their solution associated with a good word. What I'm going to do quickly here is take you through how to think about the different types of mobile payments and what differentiates one type from another. Then I'm going to go through each one and talk about what problem it solves and some of the service providers examples and then introduce a little bit more complexity right at the end. Unfortunately, mobile payments is confusing. And so part of what we try and do at Judo is simplify the complex. So let's break this down. Let's think about what happens with a mobile payment. How do I know what we're really talking about here? So the first question to ask yourself is, are we using the consumer's phone or not? If the answer is no, you are not using the consumer's phone, this is mobile point of sale. And again, I'll come back to that in a second. So if yes, it is the customer who has their phone in their pocket, who's using their phone to, to engage in a mobile payment, the next question we ask is, where is the secure element? Because at payment, security is at the heart of everything we do. So the first option is it's in the phone. And so the idea here is that within the phone itself, there's a secure element that has a idea of taking your phone and tapping it against a terminal, and that would complete the payment. This is primarily popular in Japan. Some people say that NFC stands for, I won't say it there because it's a dirty word. Um, and strangely, people refer to this as contactless, even though it's contactful. But so we've got, it's using the consumer's phone, the secure elements in the phone, and so that's called contactless, contactless or NFC. So coming back to where that secure element is, if we go in the cloud, well then the key question is, are you buying a good or service? If the answer is no, then we're talking about mobile banking. And again, I'll come back to the problem solved here, but mobile banking is particularly big in the developing world where we've bypassed traditional, traditional bank accounts and the mobile phone is actually being used to move money from peer to peer. There's a lot of different elements in mobile banking here and unfortunately it's being lumped under mobile payments um, where that's really, it belongs in its own separate category. But if we go back to yes, you are buying a good or service, we're now talking about mobile commerce or m-commerce. And this is exactly where Judo really, really focuses. And for the most part, when people are comparing e-commerce to mobile commerce, this is what we're talking about. So unfortunately, it gets even more confusing from there. Under mobile commerce, the question really becomes, who has the customer account? And then you can break it in down into five basic categories of mobile commerce. In the first instance, if the customer account is held by the issuing bank or the card schemes, so that's Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Diners, JCB, etc., then that's a card payment, a mobile commerce card payment. Next, if the account's held by a uh, mobile operator or a telco, so think in the UK, O2 or Vodafone, um, in the US, maybe either T-Mobile or Verizon, then that's called carrier billing. And in this instance, the charge goes to your mobile phone bill. Next, we have bank transfer. In the US, that's ACH. In continental Europe, that's things like Ideal. Coming soon in the UK, you'll be able to use faster payments pretty easily. Um, th there's also ping it could be considered uh, bank transfer, but it can also be considered mobile banking. Next, we have alternative payment methods. An alternative payment method, the one most well known is PayPal. And this is making a payment with a different account login structure that is part of mobile commerce. And finally, and a big discussion point in all the rage right now is virtual currencies. And a virtual currency is something like Bitcoin, which means it's actually not tied to any um, bank or currency or type. Um, it's a separate creation of a currency that can be used in order to purchase things. 
Um, again, the most well-known is Bitcoin. So the complexity that goes all against this is then are we talking about mobile app, a native app, mobile web, and it goes on and on. And in all of these instances in mobile commerce, they are at some point funded by a bank transfer. So if it's a card payment, it's a debit card, it's actually being funded by the bank. If it's a credit card, at some point you're going to pay for it with your bank. Some point in an alternative payment mechanism like PayPal, you have to load funds in there. And so it's either coming from that card by the bank or directly from the bank. The exception is the virtual currency, but at some point you have to buy that virtual currency unless you're the initiator of it and you've actually done the digging to, wit to gain that virtual currency. So it's pretty convoluted. What we recommend with most folks engaging in mobile commerce is they give a few of these options at checkout that make sense for your business. The more options you give, the more you're going to be able to expand your net to consumers. So let's go back up a little bit and talk about what these different pieces of mobile payments are solving and why those problems are, are um, interesting, but then also who's really doing it and, and making a big wave in that market. So the first in mobile point of sale. This is the best known player in this space is Square. There's also in Europe iZettle, um, uh, Paylevin, and quite a few other, sum up, quite a few other players. And what they do is they've basically taken the card terminal, which you've seen in every store you've ever gone into, shrunk it down, and allowed it to associate it with your mobile phone, because your mobile phone is a computer. The problem they were really solving with the induction of mobile point of sale is less around mobility, although that's been a big help and will be a driver of growth in the future, and it's more about expanding access to credit card acceptance. Because accepting cards as a merchant is quite expensive. The terminals can be very expensive, there's lots of fixed and ongoing fees, and mobile point of sale said, let's simplify this, let's make the terminal much smaller, and let's expand the number of people who can take payments. It also has the benefit of it works anywhere that you have a, 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 any sort of data connection. So let's put aside mobile point of sale. It's a very different piece of the market. Let's talk about contactless for a second. So contactless um, ha has really failed to take off as part of the phone. Um, where it's done well is in Japan. And it's pretty common in Japan for you to buy something by taking your phone and scanning against uh, an NFC reader. NFC stands for near field communication. And it's what you do in London when you're tapping in with the tube, that's NFC. So there are uses of it, but when it's in the phone, that, that method looks like it's going to die in most of the developed world at least. And the reason for that is it was a convoluted play. Here, when the secure element's in the phone, the telco owned that secure element. And it's unclear really that customers were comfortable with taking their very expensive phone and hitting it against a terminal. So that technology really seems like it's going to die off or have a smaller market. Down with mobile banking, again, this is very popular in the developing world. And the problem they're solving with mobile banking, the real problem they're solving is people did not have bank accounts or access to banks. And so the mobile phone became a currency that you could chain, tra trade back and forth. Sometimes it's done in, in the form of actual calling credits. Um, and sometimes it's done in actual moving money around. I'm not going to pretend to know the mobile banking space in, in as much depth as I know the rest of this commerce space. Um, but mobile banking is, is a separate world that unfortunately is being combined under mobile payments. So we come down to mobile commerce and we think about these different players here. And so again, we talked about Visa and MasterCard being the key or the typical players in card payments. Carrier billing is often done by a company called Boku is probably the best known one there. Um, and it'll allow you to, with one tap of a button, um, buy something and it's billed to your, your um, mobile phone bill. Bank transfer we talked about in different markets. Alternative payments is primarily PayPal. And virtual currency, again, like Bitcoin. The problem that needs to be solved here and is being solved by a lot of these solutions is that when you're on a small device like a mobile phone, you have to change the way you think about engaging in a transaction. It needs to be faster, it needs to be easier, you need to take out the friction because it's more difficult to enter lengthy um, details about yourself. So all of these different payment methods are looking to simplify that. So it's rather complex, but if you can remember to ask yourself these three simple questions, whose phone is being used? Is it the consumer's? Where's the secure element? 
and are you buying a good or service, you'll easily be able to di uh, differentiate between mobile point of sale, contactless, mobile commerce, and mobile banking. Thanks for joining. Look forward to seeing you next time.